All right, we got Paul Brannigan, author of Unchained, the Eddie Van Halen story. How are you doing, Paul? I'm very good, thank you, Brent. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you. You know what I loved? It blew me away. The beginning of the book is where you, instead of just comparing them to Eric Clapton and these, you talk about skateboarders like Tony Alva and stuff. I love that 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 image, man. You compare Eddie to skateboarders. Yeah, well, I, I was sort of thinking about, um, you know, obviously Eddie was... Um, he did pay his dues to the, the guitarists who influenced him. And, you know, he did acknowledge Clapton. He did acknowledge Page. He did acknowledge Alvin Lee and people like this. And um, obviously, you know, no one comes from, um, you know, out of the blue. Everyone's got their sort of guitarists and their influences that shape them. But it just struck me that that sort of sense of daring and that sense of adventure was quite sort of tuned into that time, you know, and uh, that sort of sense of building the world anew. Um, you know, I remember reading a book about skateboarders. And they said that skateboarders see the world in a totally different way. You know, where other people see obstacles, they see challenges and they see excitement. Um, yeah. well, rather than sort of thinking, oh, my God, I can't get past that. They look at it and go, brilliant. Here's a, a new way of approaching this. So it kind of struck me as to how in Eddie's guitar playing, it was always about doing something different, always about abandoning the rules and always about that sense of just leaping and then waiting to see where you fall and the, you know, the excitement about being airborne and not quite knowing where you're going to come down, that, that sense of exhilaration and danger every time. That's such a cool metaphor. And, and uh, you grew up in Ireland, right? Am I correct? I did, yes. And I grew up in the East Coast in New Jersey, suburban New Jersey with lots of snow. And I looked at California as a kid. Did you look at Van Halen? I love the way your imagery of California and Van Halen, it felt the same way to me. They kind of represented California, right? And Eddie? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And one thing that sort of struck me, and I mean this with no disrespect to anywhere in America that's not California and it's not mm -hmm. LA, but there's almost as much difference between, you know, Atlanta and California or Minnesota and California as there is between Belfast and California. I mean, most of America. I agree has with you. Nothing to do with Los Angeles. Whatsoever. The first time I went to Los Angeles from Jersey was way more shocking than going to Japan or Germany. I always say that, right? So you get it. It was everything for us growing up. It was a yeah. So I can see, like, not only were they sort of selling the American dream to, you know, Europe and overseas, but they were selling the American dream back to America, and it was kind of, and it was amazing that there was a couple of European kids uh, initially who were doing that and, and more, you know, they were all immigrant kids, you know, from Roth, Michael Anthony and the two Van Halens, all came from Europe, all sold the American dream back to America. It's huge. That's a huge concept. I never even thought of that. That's wild, man. Because they represented it. Do you remember those pictures? There's some one picture I can never find again of Eddie and he's in probably Sunset Town. He's got the Whopper next to him, hamburgers and just, just yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's uh, yeah Neil's uh, Slauser photographs, and yes, the room is just trash. You know, mm -hmm. it's just they they sort of went in there. You know, they said themselves we went in there and had a party, and it's all like hot dog wrappers and you know Schlitz beers and and I guess Schlitz, you know, Schlitz was always the beer for them. Yeah, that was always their one. Yeah, and it's just you know they sort of went in there and literally got drunk, did a few other things to get loosened up, mm -hmm. ate their burgers, and just cranked through it as if they were playing live shows. And it's funny that you said it because you, you talk about the hamburgers and there's always pictures of McDonald's, a lot of hamburger pictures with, with Van Halen, which are a, a big part of it. And and I worked with Kim Fowley. He was a good friend of mine. Wow. Who you quote in the book and he'd always say to me, hey, man, the greatest thing about Van Halen you have is all you had to give is Roth or Eddie a cheeseburger and a joint and they were happy and they make platinum. Right. <laughs> man of simple pleasures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, uh, then there's deeper stuff. Like I was floored by the Dylan song. You have, you get some Eddie psyche towards the later years. That blew my mind because I love Time Out of Mind. That was that was. Crazy. Yeah, I mean it's weird because I'd never actually. I mean that that was from an interview I did in 1998, so 23 years ago. Um, and I'd never at the time I never actually sort of I you know I mentioned track three, but I never actually went and saw what track three was. So it was literally only this time around where. I thought, well, I'll go and check out what track three is. And then it just, you know, it's sort of weird to the sort of um, the parallel really, you know, for what, what was happening right now. And, you know, it's sort of, it's hard to see, you know, 
it's hard to see the latter half of, of Eddie's life as anything but a bit of a tragedy. You know, so much wasted potential and so much sort of, I guess, sadness and, and pain in, you know, in what was going on. Obviously, happy moments too and triumphant moments. And, you know, it's good. It's great that the band went out on a sort of a high with the final tour with Roth. But, you know, to think that in those 23 years, there was never another piece of original brand new music that, you know, came out of one of the most talented musicians of the 21st century is, you know, quite a sort of sobering thought. But I think they were tied. I did love what me wise magic, but they were so tied to our youth and representing California. You know, it's almost like Van Halen wasn't supposed to age in a way. You know what I mean? It was. So yes, yeah. It just represented everything. I'm sure to you, it meant this, this thing, every picture, the back of diver down with them. Like it just meant so much as a kid with MTV, they, they own the decade, you know what I mean? Yeah, there was so much energy there and so much color. And, you know, I mean, people used to talk about when um, color television came in that the world changed from monochrome to technicolor. And it's almost like Van Halen did that in a sense, you know, in, 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 the, in the rock world, you know, particularly, I think, striking with, I mean, it's, it's the opposite way around really that it should be. But that first tour was Sabbath, you know, because obviously Sabbath have deliberately painted themselves in sort of, you know, monochrome and it's doomy and it's dark and everything's, you know, oppressive and moody. And then you get Van Halen and it's, and suddenly the lights come on and it's razzle dazzle and it's showbiz and it's like, oh my God, what is this, you know? Um, and that's sort of sense of, yeah, just the world turning day glow and everyone being utterly dazzled and charmed at once is quite an exciting idea. That's what I really love about your book is you bounce between the way you just looked at it, this very spiritual, like, that why you know why we love them but then you also bounce between facts you give us facts and 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 pull back you know what i mean from the the why to the facts how'd you choose to do it that way i really that's really what i love about this book i don't i mean i guess it's, it's sort of generally high right but i mean there has been obviously a number of books on on van halen um particularly now uh obviously and i you know, you mentioned Greg Redoff, um, you know, a great, great writer. I mentioned him in the book and, you know, his Van Halen Rising book was such a, is such a definitive and um, in-depth uh, research book. And, you know, really well. It was well a game written. changer, right? It was a game changer. Very much so. It's, you know, and I, I, I sort of specifically mentioned that and recommend that in the sort of acknowledgements of the book saying, you know, if you want to read a book about Van Halen, assuming you've read this one at this point, then, you know, go, go get that one. But um, yeah, there's, you know, that sort of at a, at a point, you know, I was like, well, I can't do that. But, you know, what I can do is sort of, I, I think I tend to see books more in that sort of, in sense of like a film script or something. So I try and sort of zoom in on particular scenes and then pull out again to get the sort of helicopter view. So you're sort of always moving the, the narrative along, but, you know, focusing in on certain things that I think are sort of emblematic or, you know, symbolic of the story. Yeah, because, you know, I'm sure you're a rock book fa fan like myself. When you open a rock book and you get like, let's say a new Motley Crue book came. I'm like, oh, or Springsteen, same book. You're like, oh, it's the same book that I've read. The same, the same. Re -re but as soon as I heard the skateboarding and the Dylan, I was like, wow, this is different out of the gate. This is stuff I didn't know. You know what I mean? Thank you. Well, that, no, that, that's very kind of you. I mean, that's obviously that's the objective because they I think you're very aware as well as as a writer that things have been done before, you know, and I have, I mean, I could literally reach them if I wanted to now and show them, you know, there are, the Van Halen books are all at hand, you know, everybody wants some Van Halen rising, you know, the, the different guitar world sort of um, Stephen Rosen interviews and the Jazz Obrecht interviews, you know, I have all those and I know all those and I know how they go and, you know, the, the sort of the challenge is to try and find something new and maybe teach someone something different. And I mean, I learned things in the sort of, writing of this book so hopefully somebody else might too and i and i love just i your perspective them felt a lot like eyes of just this magical thing when you call them they were made of fast cars loose morals cheeseburgers cocaine and like that that that's what it felt like that is what it felt like man yeah well i mean say like you say like i grew up in ireland that we had no sort of concept of you know california beyond sort of chips and you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. sort of whatever was pumped in. So through funny that chips is such a part of cult. Chips was Leaf Garrett on chips was rock to me. Like, yeah, well, we only had maybe like, growing up, we had three channels of television, three, <laughs> and then you know by the time I reached sort of fourteen, I think we were up to four. But there was it was a very sort of limited 
sort of view. So, you know, you had three or four, you know, Hawaii Five O or something was America or, yeah. you know, a number of sort of TV shows. But I say, for me, you know, sort of Van Halen was California more than any TV show, more than any book I'd read. You know, I wasn't reading The Grapes of Wrath when I was 14. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was Van Halen 1 and that was my um, California. And, you know, to a teenage boy, the Van Halen vision of California with, you know, the girls and the heat and the, you know, the part, the constant party, you know, when you're living up, when you're, sorry, when you're growing up in, uh, you know, Northern Ireland, which all you're hearing on the news is bombs and guns and yeah. death and, you know, fury and division. And then you get this vision of palm trees and bikinis, you know, suddenly that's not a bad escapist world to dive into. Wow, that's huge. Oh my gosh. That, that that's that and, and what was your first uh gateway and when? When did you when did you get hit? Well, by? I was about 14 and I it actually came from my friend, school friend, um Angus Denver, who I thank in the acknowledgement. So his elder brother, Mark and Rory, I think they were into sort of White Snake and Rush and vans like that. And you know, my I'd sort of got into sort of like punk rock first, um, through like stiff little fingers who were an Irish punk rock band and you know, that was really absolutely spoke to me as a sort of, you know, as I say, as a teenager growing up in that environment too. They were only, you know, sort of four or five years older than me. Um, but then, yeah, I started you know, listening to ACDC was the first rock band. And, you know, I loved that. And then he was like, oh, you know, if you like that, maybe you'll like these. And um, yeah, gave me, um, gave me Van Halen 1, the first record. And it was just like, I mean, mind blowing. And then, you know, when I was about 15, I started to play guitar myself really badly. So I'm not going to talk about that at all. But what the only reason I mentioned it is I, I had a guitar teacher called uh, Rocky. And um, I went to his house for the first sort of lesson. And he played me Eruption standing on his head. Like <laughs> he's upside down on his couch, you oh, know, sort of legs up in the air. And he played oh. Eruption, you know, sort of upside down effectively. And I was like, Okay, this guy could teach me a thing or two, yeah, but you yeah, know, can yeah. we start with live wire by ACDC, please? Because that's got three chords and I don't need all that just yet, you know. Oh my god. Yeah, eruption was such a bomb going. I mean, I, I was existing when Van Halen came out, like it was there as like I was a kid. I'm 52, so it was it was already there as I came into I can't imagine it showing up out of nowhere. You're probably like younger than me, if not my age, right? I'm 51, so, so I just, we, you know, we, I just, we, I just got we, into it a bit later, but I remember talking to um, Steve Albini, the, the producer, about Led Zeppelin. Um, and I sort of said, oh, you know, I was kind of surprised that like, you'd been a punk rocker, that, you know, you'd admired Led Zeppelin because he'd done the Page and Plant record, the Walking into Clarksdale record. And he said, so, well, you know, when you're growing up, Led Zeppelin is like air. You know, you, you just breathe it in. So, you, you know, you, you cannot live without breathing in air. Growing up, you know, as a, a teenager in America in the 1970s, you breathed in Led Zeppelin. It wasn't a choice, you know. It wasn't a decision you made. It was just this is what, you know, this is how you are. This is the climate. This is how we live. And yes, yeah. yeah, so I can imagine, you know, Van Halen totally being that for, you know, sort of kids growing up getting into rock music in in you know the nineteen eighties or late seventies in America. Yeah. Too. Just this album comes out, you're like, whoa, 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 because there's really guitar. There's really guitar before and after him. It's like a Wayne Gretzky in hockey or Jim, you know, there's guitar before and after Eddie Van Halen. Very definitely. Yeah. And one of the things I sort of mentioned in the book is, and this is sounded like a ridiculous statement. So I'll try and I'll say the statement. No, but get I'm ridiculous. Like, That's one of the best you know, ones. What man. I was going to say is, you know, to me, Eddie Van Halen is almost like the um, godfather of alternative rock in the sense more than Kurt Cobain, because I've interviewed almost all those significant musicians from the nineties and every one of them without fail said, the reason I play the music that I do is because I knew I couldn't be Eddie Van Halen. Every one of them, when they picked up the guitar, that was the gold standard. And they were like, man, I, you know, I can't do that. You know, Kurt Cobain or whatever, or Tom Morello or Adam Jones or, you know, Paige Hamilton, any of them. They were like, I couldn't be Eddie Van Halen. So what I needed to do was find my own voice and find my own way of playing. And um, so I would say that all those significant guitarists in the sort of 1991, um, you know, from Kim Tile through to Tom Morello, whatever, literally their starting point is the acknowledgement that they can't play like Eddie Van Halen um, and therefore find their own voice. And, and that's also why all those guys love Kiss, 
because yeah. obviously it's the opposite end of the scale. It's, you know, four chords of simplicity. It's turn it up in the garage loud. And yeah. so, yeah, so to me, you know, he not only did Eddie sort of define a generation of guitar players, but there was also a generation of guitar players who defined themselves against what he was doing. Not necessarily yeah. in opposition, but just an acknowledgement of like, well, I'm, I'll never be that, so I'm going to be me. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and, and it, yeah, just that, that's a really th- blown my mind on that one. That's crazy, man. And when did you decide to write this book? Cause this has been a while. Someone said that you've been a, a while. This has been. Yeah. It's been a huge saga. I mean, I don't, I don't want people. I mean, it, I, I actually pitched, I actually got the book deal for it in 2013 and it was due to be handed in 2015. And I'm not going to give into sort of all the reasons why it's late, but I also don't want people thinking it was like some eight year project. Because that isn't true. It got right. shelved for quite a while, and um, yeah, not to get sort of too deep into it, but okay. part of it was sort of down to a sort of sense of anxiety, really, that, that I felt, and I was really sort of struggling to put one word after another. You know, some people, the whole writing process is like an effortless breeze. You know, they are the Eddie Van Halens of the writing world. You yeah, know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very much not. I'm the clunky guy in the garage. You know. Yeah looking for the d chord uh, after i played a and uh, so uh yeah it, it took a while and i i basically i mean I, I you know the truth is i sort of lost the initial book deal that i had even being given chance after chance after chance to um you know submit um chapters and uh sort of the reason for the book being resurrected was that like so many other people i lost my job in the when the pandemic kicked in um, I was at that point. I was editing a magazine called Planet Rock in yeah, London. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was a really fun sort of classic rock magazine. Really, really enjoyable. But um, the publishers sort of last summer said, "Look, you know, there are no shops opened. We can't get this magazine out to people like we can. We're now sort of selling a quarter of what we were, and there's yeah. no sense of when the shops are going to open again. I mean, the restrictions were quite um, tough in the UK, so they were just like, well." We're not, you know, we don't think we can ride this out. Other established magazines that have been around, I mean, they actually closed another magazine that had been around 30 years. We had been around three, four. Mm -hmm. So that disappeared off the radar. And suddenly I was, like I said, 50 years old, never done anything else in my life professionally apart from write and Mm -hmm. had no gig anymore. And the one thing that I had got was the bare bones of of this book and the sort of, the idea and the sort of passion for it. And it was like, you know, if I don't do this now, <laughs> yeah. I'm never going to do this. So that's awesome. let's dive back in and let's see where we get to. And unfortunately, you know, I guess the sense of uh, desperation <laughs> that that was needed um, in order to sort of get it, get it finished um, sort of came through and then a lot of time to sort of refine it and tweak it or whatever. And so, yeah, you know, sales, that'd be wonderful if it happens, you know, sort of, reviews that'll be wonderful if it happens yeah. but actually more than anything else i'm just happy for me that this book exists because not finishing that book was probably the biggest failure of my professional life so it's done i like i'm happy now and if it's if it's the last thing i ever do i know it's done and i and i sort of ticked the box and, and finished it and you know managed to overcome that um you know that last that last uh Half pipe, you know. That, yeah, that so I love the skateboard analogies. Finally, and, and, finally got down on all four wheels, you know. And then, and, and like you said at the end, Eddie Van Halen talks about loving what you do, and you, and and that could sound pedestrian, but you really do believe him at the end of your book when he talks about loving what you do. You just got to love what you do. Yeah, definitely. And you know, I think there's obviously times where Eddie's love of the business faltered, but you know, you always sense that his love of playing guitar never did you know there's a point where Alex mentions that you know after he sort of got Eddie got together with Valerie Bertinelli and there was a lot of attention being put on them and there was I guess a lot of pressure on him as sort of the golden boy of of US rock to keep coming up with the goods and um, you know a lot of media attention and he was sort of he was saying to Alex look you know this isn't what I signed up for you know I want out and actually even on the very first um, European tour with Van Halen and this is something that uh, to, to give due credit, you know, was from Noel's Monk's book about, you know, you find Eddie in tears in Paris saying, look, I want to go home. I want to go home. This is that, you know, I don't want this. I don't want to be a rock star. You know, I'm a musician. This is why I do this. So, yeah, that sense of, you know, 
for all the sort of glittering rewards that um, music brought Eddie, there was that sense of just, this is a guy who's got that sheer joy of, of being a, a being musician and, and um, playing for himself, really. You know, I mean, there's one thing, and I sort of mentioned it in the intro, that, you know, my uh, vision of Eddie Van Halen, when I think of Eddie Van Halen, is that guy sort of looking down at his fretboard himself and looking down at his own fingers with this sort of sense of wonder and awe of the, the noise that's coming out, the magic yeah. that's filling forth, and sort of Disney fantasia yeah. notes filling, filling the room. And it, it, it's not a sort of, you know, it's not a focused, concentrated, you know, where's the next note on the uh, Phrygian scale? It's, um, you know, it's like, wow, look, look what's, you know, what's been passed through me, what's been channeled through me. Um, and I, I sort of put a quote in as well from um, Jay Sobrecht, who wrote for Guitar Player magazine in the 70s and 80s. And he said, you know, more than anyone, he, said he spoke to Hendrix as following, he said, more than anyone, Eddie Van Halen reminded me of Hendrix in that music was being channeled through him, you know, and he was sort of the vessel for this to come back out again. He said it was so natural and so, you know, unthinking. Um, not, you know, not, that's not to sort of um, suggest there wasn't thought behind it, there wasn't, there wasn't hard work or theory had gone into it, but sort of so self-conscious and natural and flowing. And that was the sort of the joy that you sort of, people saw in Van Halen. And I think for a lot of people, beyond the sort of the cliches of the sex, the drugs and the rock and roll and the sunshine and whatever, there was that sort of sense of someone operating in a zone of pure joy and happiness that was so exhilarating and so infectious. Definitely. And and even the story, that interview, how it took place at Oakland, we'll let people read it at Oakland Coliseum. That was where that took place, that interview with Jay, right? Yes, it was. Yeah. And I'd say, you know, it wasn't supposed to happen. He was there to uh, interview Pat Travers and Pat Travers kind of blew him off. I guess it was, you know, Pat Travers probably had the girls and the whiskey and whatever in the dressing room and was like, yeah, do I need the nerd from guitar player here? But you said in the book, if we're talking, Ed just goes, why don't you interview me? And that's just, he almost has that Springsteen wanting to be the common man thing. And I, I've heard stories where he really did want to kind of, I know we had Lamborghinis and lots of stuff, but in movie star wise, but he was very common man in a lot of ways. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I'm sure you notice that the more you sort of talk to musicians, sometimes you see that sort of little boy within, you know, you see that sort of, well, one thing I sort of saw, I spent most, most of my life sort of interviewing uh, rock and metal musicians, and particularly with the metal musicians, you know, when you interviewed someone like, you know, Marilyn Manson or the guys from Korn or, you know, Deftones or whatever, it's not, a, or Lars Ulrich, you know, you don't see a sort of like rock superstar you know, what you see is some geeky kid that, that was the same as your friends when you were all playing in garages together. You know, yeah. that, that sense of like the sheer joy of, of music and, you know, like discovering records and um, you sort of still see that in those people. And, you know, one of the things that a lot of musicians like doing is when you don't talk to them about their music, when you talk to them about the records that influence their life, that's when they light up and that's when they get excited and that's when they become super relatable. Whereas if you're the 15th person that day to ask them about track three on, on you know, side two of the record, it's like, <sighs> yes, it's bad. You know, you see them gloss over and you see them tune out. And they, you know, they might as well hand you the, you know, a sheet of paper with a transcript for what they've said yeah, to yeah. 16 other interviewers that day. Um, but, you know, talk to them about Destroyer or talk yeah. to them about, you know, Van Halen 1. And suddenly they're they're back in the room as a fourteen year old, bursting with excitement of hearing that record again. It's so true. I know you did the Dave Grohl book, and our friends at Rami from the Foos, and he knows I love Springsteen. Because if you ever meet Springsteen, just talk to him about Strawberry Alarm Clock or one of those bands. They'll go on forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, that's yeah, the yeah. once you find that sort of mutual mutual connection. I mean, and Grohl's the same. Obviously, you know, you talk to him about ACDC or you know Bad Brains or whoever, and he's locked right in there, you know, and say that's, I kind of like that, that commonality, you know, universality. So, you know, you say, obviously you say, we grew up on opposite sides of the Atlantic, but you know, the, the, the thing I love about music is that sort of power to bring people together. And, um, you know, and you realize that there is shared experiences no matter where you grew up. And, you know, I went to, um, I went to school for a year in Washington, DC um, at Georgetown University. And literally on my first day on campus, I could tell the people that I was going to be friends with later that year because back then it was a t-shirt and it was a haircut and it was a pair of Dr. Martin boots 
and it was you were like you know on a university campus it's pretty square and pretty straight and pretty preppy it was like ah oh, there's a purple haired one the tribe yeah. you got to pick there's, a tribe yeah there's a nose ring and there's you know long hair and you think okay those are these are going to be my people and you know i remember we um went to there was like a college radio station which essentially by that point only broadcast on campus and um yeah, I went to the meeting with that with some of my friends and literally every one of those, you know, little outcasts and little freaks, they were all in that room. And it was like, OK, gotcha. You know, this is this is going to be my, you know, Washington, D.C. for the nine months ahead. It's not going to be, you know, the, the basketball players and it's not going to be the lacrosse team. You know, these yeah. 50 people, this is going to be my world for this year. Totally. And where I grew up, there was even microcosms within the rock world. I just went to a thrash show, which I don't love thrash, but when I, where I grew up, you couldn't like, I liked Motley Crue, Van Halen, Rat. You couldn't, you can go to the thrash. I was a poser. It was like, it was like Bloods and Crips. You had to pick a tribe. You know what I mean? Right. Well, I mean, in, in Northern Ireland, when I grew up, we sort of, I mean, you, you sort of had that, but you didn't really have that luxury because it was like two bands coming in per year, you know? So, uh, you know, my first gig was Wasp. Uh, but it was, you know, I, I wanted it to be Metallica and Anthrax uh, about six months earlier, and I couldn't get anybody to go with me. I, I, I lived in the countryside, couldn't get anybody to go. And um, on the Master of Puppets tour, I liked, it's one of the biggest regrets of my life that I didn't go on my own, and I didn't. And then Cliff Burton died, and I would never see that lineup of Metallica. So, you know, from then on, it was like, you know what, I'm never going to depend on anybody else for going to a show and no, you know can't. if I want to see a show I'm going to the show I don't care if any of the rest of you are going so yeah I, I was seeing both bands I was seeing you know Wasp and then Megadeth and then Anthrax and Testament and then Alice Cooper so it was sort of there were things I liked more than others but you had a band like Guns N' Roses obviously when I was 17 who seemed to sort of draw in from both worlds you know they yeah they really them. did they seemed like after yeah, Van Halen the big bomb going off that's you know that yeah was- I mean, one, one of the things I, I mentioned, and obviously, you know, there's the, a lot of uh, advocates for the Roth period. There's a lot of advocates for the Hagar period. But, but to me, you know, uh, when Van Halen were doing OU812, you know, just after Appetite for Destruction, it was, you know, I'm not saying the torch had been passed exactly, but it was a different world. You know, one was, you know, Jerry Bruckheimer's soundtracks and gloss and money and, you know, still the cocaine but a better class of cocaine. Yeah. And, uh, and then you had, you know, Guns N' Roses who were like street rats. You know, they were oh, bad speed. They were like stolen drinks. They were, you know, the girls from the Tropicana. It was just street level LA, a totally different vision. They brought Hollywood to where you and I lived. I moved there because of that band and Motley Crue, but Crue was like, cool, it was Hollywood. Guns were like, no, we're going to bring you into Hollywood as a, you know what I mean? Axel getting off the bus with the straw resonate, you know, I'm sure for you too. It was a little bit more of us, whereas Nikki Six was like Spider-Man to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you have these sort of, you know, everyone sort of likes the superheroes, which is obviously why Kiss had sort of such an appeal for, you know, so many sort of American teens particularly. But yeah, when you looked at like Slash and Duff, uh, well, not less Slash, sorry, more Izzy and Duff, and you were like, Ah, they, you know, those are little rats. They're yeah, like, yeah, yeah, they're like yeah. my friends. You know, you knew that they'd got never mind the bollocks in their collection, and you knew they'd got Aerosmith rocks, and you knew they'd sort of lived it and you know, got into the scraps and done all the, the bad things that teenagers are supposed to do, and then came to Hollywood and did sort of chase the dream as well. Totally. Now, uh, I got my ticket because I had the for the, the final Roth shows. What's your opinion? You think they're going to be his final? I got the Wednesday in Vegas, January 3rd, I'm going. You think they'll be his final shows? I mean, it, it seems that, you know, I was sort of talking about this the other day. And the one thing it, it, to me, it, seem, it seems so weird that it was such a low key way of breaking his, you know, his retirement. It was like, in my mind, if David Lee Roth is going out, He's going out with an interview in the New York Times or he's going out in an interview with Rolling Stone and it's going to be, you know, set up and it's going to be, you know, the final interview or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like calling a guy from the local paper <laughs> and saying, actually, this is going to be the end. Like, shut up. I'm going to talk. You're going to write this down and then we're going to report this, you know, worldwide. Roth, you know, is such a sort of um, master, I wouldn't say manipulator, but... Uh, from the start, he was so aware of the power of the media and so aware of, you know, the power of his own voice, the attention that it could bring. 
and everything was, you know, sort of maximum impact and, you know, design, every word was sort of thrown out there for a reason. Um, and it just seemed so odd that he would yeah, sort of yeah. announce the time in such a sort of casual kind of way. But who, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, really one of the greatest rock showmen ever. And, and, he gets, and everybody gives him a bad... I think his voice has always been incredible. People give him a bad rap, but I think one of the greatest singers and poets, street poets, as good as Springsteen. You know what I mean? Mean streets? Come on. That's... Street poetry. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, like a lot of my favorite singers aren't the greatest technical singers. You know, it's people who've got a personality and people who've literally got a voice, whether that's, you know, John Lydon or Perry Farrell or Kurt Cobain. Yeah. You know, they, as soon as you hear them, you know it's them. And the yeah. same with Roth, you know, I mean, and as much as how influential, you know, Roth was and, you know, he was the sort of pin up boy of, of American rock as well. But you know, people could imitate him. You could have, you know, the guys from Warrant or, you know, whoever with it with the big hair, but nobody else was was David Lee Roth. And um nobody still is David. You watch those Joe Rogan interviews, you're like, he's still just a beast, just just his own planet. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, uh, you know, fantastic for you for to go on to those shows and you know oh, I'm excited. I mean, they're gonna be they're gonna be a great atmosphere, you know, and in, in a sense, I guess I hope they are the last shows because you want somebody to go out with the high, with that level of excitement, that to step off that stage, knowing you know, job done. You know, I, I this is this is I chose this moment. This is yeah. when I want. You know, I chose when I came in. I chose when I walk away. That's kind of a, a nice feeling for a for any artist or for any human being, really, just to to say, yeah. yeah completed it thank you and i love his new songs i love that the, i feel like they're a nice touch about i get a feeling from him and roth was one of the first rockers to to me to make non-rock dummy when he put this one of the first rockers with a book you know what i mean and a great yeah. book i mean i love that book man yeah i mean he's such a fantastic sort of storyteller which is obviously what sort of played into the songs well i mean so compelling and i mean the guy can talk for you know, if, if you ever, you know, I wanted an international talking champion if we were up against any other planets or any other, you know, star federations, you know, well, put, it, put Roth up there. He can, he can, he can represent us as far as I'm concerned. It, it's a breed though. And then we'll end on this, um, cause you know, I work with Kim Fowley and he was the same way. And he would talk about Roth just sitting at Denny saying he was going to be number one, but Roth, Charles Manson and Kim Fowley, they all have a similar thing where when you talk with them, you feel like you ran a marathon. I haven't talked with Charles Manson or Roth, but I would imagine you you feel like you've run a marathon, <laughs> you know, but they kind of, it's this jazz be beatnik. I don't know what it is, but it's a thing. Yeah, I mean, there's only sort of a handful of uh, even sort of rock stars in my life where you're sort of, you're in their presence and you realize the show is on, you know, I mean, I, I, I had it with Steven Tyler and I had it with Chris Robinson you know, from the Black Crows once. We were in Barcelona and um, I think we I was in town doing Slayer and Sepultura and System of a Down. We were playing together and the Black Crows must have been playing somewhere else in the in the city. And we were back in the hotel and I came into the hotel bar and there's like some skinny little pipe cleaner, you know, guy who's this thin, sort of standing in the room going, meh, 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 meh. and, you know, everyone just sort of like standing around and like gazing up like children looking up at Jesus or something. Oh, and uh, you're like, well, who the hell's that? And you sort of get a bit closer and you realise it's Chris Robinson. And I mean, I, I never interviewed Chris Robinson. And, I'm, you know, I, I like the early Black Crows, but I'm not like some Black Crow super fan. But I'll always remember that as like, wow, that guy's a star. You know, and you're just literally sort of sitting back, observing and go, you know, you're sort of, again, sort of drinking it in like this is their mm -hmm. world. And you're just you just feel allowed to sort of get into the spotlight or, you know, get into the shadows of, of their spotlight for, you know, for one one moment. And, you know, I can imagine Roth is entirely like that, you know, just this dazzling light that goes on and, you know, everyone else is like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what to look, but peering through their fingers and not able to take in the full luminescence of it. See that, and, and that is what you capture in this book along with the facts. That's what I really like, what you just described, that magic, the magic of Van Halen and Eddie Van Halen. And, Thank you so much, Paul. So this comes out December 28th, right? I believe so, yes. Here in America. Yeah, it's already, uh, we've got the this is the UK version where the book is called Eruption. That's out already, and it's out already in Germany. So this is the US version. And obviously, you know, the, U the US, when I, when I sort of pitched this book, you know, I guess I said to the UK publisher and stuff, like, I know this isn't going to set the world on fire in, in the UK, you know, and I know it's not going to do that, you know, Van Halen, is America, you know, mm -hmm. and so I'm really, like I say, I'm really appreciative. Um, 
the guys from Premier Press, and we've got this book out in the States, you know, I say a deal did elapse and that was my fault. That was nobody's fault but mine. I can make clear, but the fact that you have that book in your hand, I mean, I haven't got a copy yet. Oh, you do. It. It uh, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, literally the fact that I can see that is uh, really exciting to me and I'm so pleased that it's in the hands of, you know, people like yourself in America yeah. and whoever else chooses to pick that up, that, that's going to be a bonus, but the fact that it's there, a physical thing and, you know, isn't some... Uh, Albatross that's hovering above me, reminding me of my failure, is uh, <laughs> yeah. a joy to me. Feels like a like you know a new album. You know certain books they're low and, and it, God bless self published digital printed, but this is a nice book, like a nice new album, man. It just feels good, looks good, and it feels good. Just I just look at it, and it makes me happy, man. Oh, thank you. I mean that, that's really lovely to hear. I mean say yeah for me. I mean I'm still you know, old school enough that I get excited about seeing a bookshop. I was li I literally- Oh yeah, yeah, shop. yeah. This day last week, I walked into a shopping center. My kid was at football. It was a horrible day. And I walked into the shopping center and it was a bookshop. And I was like, oh my God, a bookshop. And I went there and I actually bought the Springsteen book, you know, you mentioned earlier, which I've been meaning to buy for ages, Springsteen oh. Autobiography. And it was just that excitement of, you know, half of it, you know, so I went into mm -hmm. Shake Shack, I sat it down and started reading it, sort of cracking the, you know, cracking the spine for the very first time. And, you know, I still get that excitement around vinyl records or, you know, just, I mean, yeah, vinyl records or even CDs still and or around a good book, you know, when you're trying to find a book and there it is. So, yeah, I'm, you know, I get I that. Agree with you. The only time I don't get the know. book is when, uh, like, the Grohl or the Nikki Six, when they read them, sometimes I really enjoy when the author, those guys read their own books. It, it's pretty yes, fun. So yeah. I'll go audible with that, but... uh well, thank you so much and hang out. Say goodbye to everybody and hang out so I can say goodbye, Paul. Thank you very much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure.